lots of you know strange proposals and strange clients come along and i think the more your confidence grows the more confident you get of saying no and to me it's intuition hello and welcome to the business of architecture podcast i'm your host ryan willard and today i have the great pleasure of speaking with l Batortite, the brain behind studio hell which is in beautiful surrey just south of london in the uk um really interesting location for practice um interestingly l and myself grew up in a very similar region of the country. So I was quite familiar with the territory uh, that she was practicing in. And I was very impressed with Elle because I saw her actually uh, at the Guerrilla Tactics, the RBA Guerrilla Tactics um, Day, which is a, a kind of conference for small practices about how to grow your business and how to market, how to brand yourself. And Elle gave a presentation on branding and how she'd created the brand for Studio Elle and all the sorts of things she's done when she started up her practice um, very recently, only in 2023. Um, and, and I really thought that she'd gotten a really good grasp of creating a brand. She spoke about it very articulately. Um, she was very focused on, you know, actually building out a niche or establishing a niche, understanding the demographics of that niche, understanding which niche was actually going to be profitable for her, a niche that she had access into, very thoughtful kind of um, selection there. And she's built the brand around serving that clientele. So the brand was very customer client focused. Um, we go into some of the things that she did in actually being able to establish that. Um, we talk about networking and prospecting, um, referrals and winning work. Um, and a really just good example of a startup business or a business that's in the early phases of its life, um, getting some of the fundamentals early and put into place and really, really uh, exciting uh, business woman that is here with Elle. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed talking with Elle. Um, really good podcast here with lots of nuggets of gold. So sit back and relax and enjoy Elle Batortite. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. L. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. What a pleasure to see you again and to have you on the podcast. How are you? Hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I am good. Yes, excited to have a chat and to continue our discussion. Excellent. So you are the uh, founder and principal of Studio L based in beautiful Surrey. Whereabouts in Surrey are you? I live in Sutton, uh, so actually right on the outskirts of London and just before the leafiness and the beauty begins. Well, I, well I'm right now I'm in Purley, actually, which is just around the corner from you. So I didn't realize that until just now. I was like, oh, crikey, you're, 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 you're right around the corner. Yeah, it's a very, very nice part of the country here. Um, and you've got a, a wonderful architectural interiors um, practice. You've got a very stunning portfolio of high-end residential properties. There's a very distinct um, kind of beautiful raw, lots of textural materials that you use in your in your palettes of uh, interiors um, and also a very kind of distinct brand. And I think that's one of the things we'll, we'll focus on today to talk about. And I was very impressed when I saw you talk at the uh, RBA Guerrilla Tactics and you were um, giving a masterclass on building a brand for your practice, how you've done it, how you've engaged with Instagram, how you've developed your website and how you've put this idea of branding at the forefront of your of your business and how you've been using it to negotiate, win work um, and kind of develop and build relationships. So perhaps we'll we'll start there with for you. What does what does um, what is the, what is the Studio L brand? What does branding mean for you? So the way I see a brand, it is a shop front 
to whatever service you're providing or the product that you're selling. And uh, it's a visual translation of your values um, and the language and language which is written as well as visual that other people see. Got it. And when you started your practice, what was the the kind of the thinking behind developing a brand? Was it something that you knew that you wanted to do um, from the outset or was it kind of you started up your business first and then realized something was missing? It was a core uh, part of developing a business. So when I first set out, I needed to create a website, establish social media presence and curate an Instagram account and all of those other things that all of us have to do when we start a new studio on an off- or an office. Um, so it was a way of trying to distill who I was um, personally, professionally, um, what kind of clients I wanted to attract and to curate my past work and also generate some aspirational work in order to attract the clients that I was aiming for. Got it. And was this something that you did with the help of a like an outside consultant or a, a kind of third, like a like a like an another eye to help you develop that brand, or was it a more self directed thing? It was completely self directed. Um, so I do have to say that there was a lot of trial and error in it mm-hmm. as well, um, and many iterations of trying to to distill the language into something that I felt resonated. The first couple of times definitely looked like I was sort of anything for anyone and it was it was still baby steps into trying to gain the confidence to look the way I feel like I want to look and Mm -hmm. it's an ongoing journey still often when I talk about marketing to either um, clients or other architects I'll often uh, kind of set a paradigm if you like that marketing is a test everything in marketing is a test. And when when we get into that mindset, it makes it a little bit easier because we can look at a a branding strategy or a marketing strategy and we might identify three different types of ideal clients. And then we can run a little marketing test for each one to see which one resonates. And then we do that and then you see that, okay, well, one of the three really, really resonates. And inside of that one, that that one there's three other niches that I can develop on and then we can start kind of digging down and so this is kind of iterative approach very akin to the design approach um when when you were kind of setting up your 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 brand what were the sorts of tests that you were you were running or what kinds of experiments were you doing what were you looking for I think it was exactly what you just what you mentioned Brian it was uh trying to trying to get a better understanding what sort of projects I wanted to work on. So again, going from uh, a standard career of working for someone else and someone else's office where they had a prescribed way of working and how things looked, to then having the autonomy to find your own feet. Um, It wasn't as easy as it sounds because, you know, I think we all think, oh, if I just, if I could just do that myself, I would do X. And then when you actually land there, you go, ah, let me have a think what I actually want to do and how I want to look and what people I want to interact with. So I think going through things in a visual way and, you know, all of us designers are very visual people helped me grow and kind of create a strategy, how I want my business to uh, develop. Mm -hmm. um, When you were working for somebody else, were there little nuggets of gold that you picked up from their branding activities or was it the opposite? Um, I think the the messaging was quite good, I guess. No, actually, I think it's probably the ethos of of the of the office was very strong. Mm -hmm. Probably not market. They didn't really do marketing as such. It was an incredibly organic word of mouth sort of service. Um, I think if they did marketing, the offers would absolutely explode. So Mm -hmm. I guess that's one thing I probably took away uh, from that, um, that you can be incredibly strong and good at what you do. But uh, if you're not actively putting it out there, the world doesn't the the world doesn't really know what you do. So you end up having uh, clients who are friends of clients and, you know, the, the sort of the inner circle. Um, where when you start out, you don't have that luxury. So it's kind of, you have no choice but to have to go and create a brand. Yeah. 
Well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, architecture school, design school, there's a the kind of dictum that floats around of like, you know, let your work speak for itself, which is, which is just suicide when running a business. You have to be the voice of your work. Your work does not have the, 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 the capability of speaking for itself. You've got to be the one that's, that's doing that. Um, when, you, when you first started out then, what were you looking for in terms of defining your voice or defining your, your message? What kinds of... How did you know when it was working? How did you know when to kind of let go of a certain idea? And, and, and what were the sorts of tools that you were focusing on to develop your brand? So at first, I started with uh, looking at other architects and designers in the industry that I, uh, I admire, I look up to, I like the aesthetic that they work towards. Um, so that was my starting point. But then I very quickly realized that some of them were doing it well some of them not so well some of them i could see that they could do a lot better in terms of i think the key part that i was uh seeing that was missing was architects are not very good at explaining what they do so they just assume that you know our clients understand exactly what what we do and why we deserve the fees that we ask for um and, and so on so i think that was my first sort of big uh light bulb moment to go oh, right, I, now I have to actually talk about what I do and talk in, you know, the, the language of the client, not another mm -hmm. architect. Because some of the websites are that I was coming across, all the, you know, beautiful language that we use and we can co go on for days with our terminology would not resonate. So what I did, I actually started looking at um, some of the really good product designers, uh, graphic designers, some of them were really amazing, bespoke uh, or sort of boutique estate agents. So people who weren't in the industry, but I was able to learn from from them. A lot of mm -hmm. them were actually galleries, really bes uh, like uh, boutique um, object galleries and art galleries. Um, and they had a very distinct language, which was quite memorable, um, but also still uh, approachable from the client's mm -hmm. perspective. So were you going for a process of kind of eradicating archi speak and starting to use a language that was more palatable for a target demographic? Absolutely. And that came with a different set of uh, issues because it, right. all of a sudden I was faced with this, uh, you know, internal and professional dilemma of commercials versus creative. And it's what you touched upon earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very difficult uh, conversation to have with yourself because, as, as you said, we are brought up in a cult where your work speaks for yourself. You shouldn't have to do any marketing. You don't need to speak about what you do or show people what you do. Um, and that is completely the opposite. <laughs> you need to be doing all of those things. But it's very hard to accept that and also to start and do that with elegance and the style and the mm. quality uh, that you want to you know, you want to develop and that represents who you are as a professional. Well, it, it's interesting because when I, when I look through some of your marketing collateral and, you know, again, the, the knowing as well that you're local to here, for example. So this is, I was brought up in, in Croydon, right? <laughs> and, and so I know this area and I went to school in Sutton and I know this area and I know the kind of, and I also am very aware of the, the kind of aspirational green belt um areas and that kind of language and those sorts of of, of people as well and it's really interesting because there was that kind of looking at your work looking at the materials looking at the language there's like a homeliness about it that i can connect with or a la like a, a, a there's something geographical about it i don't know what it, what exactly it is was that was was that part of your branding or was that me kind of inferring that <laughs> <laughs> um it's interesting that you say that because it was never my intention. Uh, okay. so I, I think a lot of it comes from my ex my background, my experience of mm -hmm. working in you know high end Notting Hill sort of uh, you know projects, um, mm -hmm. very high end, beautiful, very art sort of art based as well, where we cu curated spaces around art. Um, so I think that was one part of a puzzle, and another part of a puzzle was, is probably my Northern European background and the mm -hmm. sort of slight Scandinavian twist. And then the third part is actually being, you know, I, I, I grew up in Surrey, so maybe like something is subconsciously is coming out. Um, but why I say it's interesting, it's because I had 
maybe two or three clients um, that are now my, my full clients actually say that, saying, okay, well, we have these beautiful properties on the green belt. We're looking mm-hmm. for a great architect. And there's something about you which is not quite the typical suburban architect, but also we can still resonate and relate. So it's, it's working. It's- yeah, well, no, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's, the, it's the aspirational part of it as well, which is kind of like I know that there's a demographic certainly in these in the areas that have that. The, you know, because your your brand taps into something desirable, and that's mm-hmm. not something. It's not as it's not that. It's, that's a little bit intangible for a lot of architects to be able to kind of get their heads around. And sometimes we're very good at creating desire for other architects, but to create desire for homeowners is something a little bit a little bit different and, and actually quite interesting. Just out of interesting, where, whereabouts in in sorry, did you grow up? Where you are now in Sutton? Yeah, or? yeah, 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 exactly. So like near Banstead, so I'm right on, on the edge. Uh, I have to ask, where did you go to school? I went to Cheam High, which was not did a you? good choice. So it was not a good choice. With, with, you went to Cheam High with the, brown, with the brown uniforms? No, it was navy. No, brown is St. Philomena's, which is... Ah, oh, okay, I know St. Philomena's. Okay, St. Philomena's, yes, that was it. I went to Wilson's. Oh, I don't know where Wilson's is. Wilson's, in, it's in Wallington. Ah, yeah. Okay. It's okay. All right. Well, there, well, there, there you go. Probably saw you on the buses sometime years ago. Years ago. Um, uh, so, okay. Very, very interesting. So, in in terms of when you've now, you know, you've set up the your 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 brand. Um, what are you looking for then to be able to judge whether it's successful or not? My main measure is uh, clients that potential clients that get in touch, which fit my ideal client uh sort of uh criteria right and and are you marketing as well specifically to kind of very you know target housing typologies or is it more demographic of person no i think it's a it's a certain personality and certain taste uh and i guess as you said demographic of of the person that they would they would find this appealing and it would tick all of their boxes Mm -hmm. got it and and so what kinds of um sales strategies then do you use how does your sales process work what is it what does it look like from start to finish if you like of how a client discovers you are they do they fall into a kind of studio l marketing ecosystem and you're kind of you're kind of seducing them if you like with content and newsletters and things like that and then there's a kind of call to action and then you jump on a phone what's the sort of what does the funnel look like from them finding discovering you to then actually working with you so there's no there's no funnel as such. Um, I think I stand by my ethos of everything being quite bespoke and tailor made. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, which I guess in the long term will not become very commercially sustainable because it takes a lot of time to to mm-hmm. onboard clients. So usually they would get in touch. We would start a conversation. Um, if they're quite local to here, I would go straight to their house and meet them in person, and then we would chat and get to know one another. Then I go away and I put together a bespoke fee proposal because most of my clients, it's incre- there is no standard fee structure because all of them are incredibly varied in terms of scope, scale, ambition. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we, we take it from there. So, so it works for now because there aren't many projects uh, and I quite like that. I, re- I really want to keep it mm-hmm. Well, in, in that sense, but I think as I scale, there will be certain measures that are needed to control it. And and how do you negotiate, or how do you deal with, say, other other competition? Do you find yourself ever in that situation where you've given a client a proposal and they're actually shopping around, and there's two other architects that they're looking at? How do you how do you broach that as a conversation? How do you navigate around it? So I think. The location where I am, and given that most of my projects are within the Greenbelt, Surrey, I have one in Hertfordshire, so sort of home counties, it's a very specific demographic and a very specific type of project. Um, So my competition is much smaller than, say, you were in East London and you were Mm -hmm. designing every extension. Um, So I think that's to my advantage and to my benefit. Um, But I also... uh, 
I also think that the right client, the one that resonates with my aesthetic and my service and me personally, will go for Studio L at the end of the day. So I re mm -hmm. really try not to focus too much on the competition mm -hmm. and, and just, I believe that the right fit will come along. And and if the client, they say to you, like we're, we're looking at other other architects or, because often we you know, particularly in the sort of, uh, as you move outside of London, um, it, the, the market kind of changes a little bit. And as you were saying, there's a, there's a kind of a bit of a, bit of a spread between the sorts of architects that you can that you can get access to and it's not always clear to a client you know well what's the why is this architect charging this amount of money why is this architect charging this amount of money and you're charging that do, do that does that ever happen do you ever have the clients that they're either confused or um like how how do we how do we educate them I think we educate them through extensive conversation and mm -hmm. through explaining why your fees cost what they cost. So as I said, my, my long onboarding process of the clients um, basically shows them the level of service that they will be receiving. So, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't cap my revisions, for example, and I explain it to them. I say, look, my charge, my, my, my fees will be most likely much larger than most of other people you speak to. but we will work until you're happy with mm -hmm. what you get. And I, I keep educating them about the process of planning, the pros and cons, you know, what do they get if they spend 900 pounds on a planning permission, which I've heard people say. So I try to educate them, you know, we'll, we'll think about it. What, what is what is that money going to buy you? And mm -hmm. are you then going to, to rush into that process, get planning and then realize that you have a design that you absolutely do not want and you can't even afford to build? Or do you want to work with someone who will be taking you step by step in great amount of detail and very slowly and educating you through this process? And that's the message I have on my website as well. So I say that I work with clients, not uh, on behalf of the clients or for right. clients. Um, and I also empower them. So my role is not to impose a design on them. My role is to assist them in making mm -hmm. the right decision and just steer their, their visual language and Again, show them all the options that are available to them in an educated way and let them be in control of it. So I try to be as clear as I can about it from the beginning. How do you know when it's not the right fit for you? Do you ever attract a client or attract a, a prospect and within maybe the first conversation you're like, hmm, this is not going to be a good idea. And if that does happen, how do you gracefully remove yourself from any further communications? Um, bad happens quite, I wouldn't say, actually, I wouldn't say often. So it used to happen much more often right at the beginning when I right. mentioned that I was still trying to find my feet, my, my brand was not quite there yet. And I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, I tried to almost be everything for everyone because right. you know, you're starting out, you need to bring money in. Um, you're a little bit uncertain, you know, how, you know, in terms of confidence and everything else. So, um, Lots of you know strange proposals and strange clients come along, um, and I think the more your confidence grows, the more confident you get of saying no. And to me, it's intuition. But that's mm -hmm. all it is. I feel it straight away. The, someone can call me, and just from the way they speak to me, you know, if they're agitated or they're rushing it or they're already annoyed, and you go, "Hang on, I haven't. I've never even spoken to you." Mm -hmm. uh, so there are so many different clues, the way, yeah, um, the way they even phrase an email, you know, if, if they're not even bothering to say hello or, you know, to end with kind regards or anything like that, mm -hmm. there, are, there are clues everywhere. And the second you pick up on them, um, you have to really listen to it because if you have a red flag so early on, it's just going to end up in tears. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so it's so interesting. The architectural or interior design relationship with the client is so, particularly in residential, is so intimate. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also with the residential clients, there's always a, a kind of heightened level of anxiety and stress. And you know, I, when I know it for myself, when we've done our own, when we've done our own renovations, that every decision suddenly becomes uber important and there's unnecessary amount of thought and thinking that goes into it whereas when it's something more commercially focused it's you know there's a there's 
uh, maybe something there's a different set of um, criteria that's in that's enforcing decision making which can make it flow more quickly and that relationship obviously particularly with the residential clients very intimate with the architect and ultimately you are you are going to be spending a lot of time with each other and mm -hmm. if the relationship doesn't work then the whole project becomes very difficult and it's you know this is when one side stops to not communicate so well and as soon as that happens that's when we get upset well that's when that's when you know change orders don't get fulfilled or we get problems with payments we get into you know the you know it, it can become very unnecessarily adversarial very quickly within the wrong relationship and be very expensive for the architects um perspective so when so when you do you know you, know, you get a sense that it's not the right client what would you normally do would you just tell them hey i don't think this is going to be a, the right fit or you know here's another architect down the road you should probably talk to them um i have done that actually um and i don't think it's a bad thing i generally sure. don't I think the more we did that to one another the mm -hmm. better and more sustainable our business would be and mm -hmm. it's not to say oh I'm, I'm too good and go to that person actually it's the opposite i'm i will be the first person to admit to someone um, if they came to me to say, El, can you turn this around in six months and we just want a very simple job and off we go? I go, no, because that's not the service that I provide. Um, but mm -hmm. I know a great design and build company down the road who specialize in that and they are great and they will give, it, give you a brilliant service at a very reasonable price and you will get exactly what you want. And I will, mm -hmm. I will send them their way. Um, I think mm -hmm. the world of architecture would be a much better place if we all did that we had that you know confidence and just the kindness to go you know i think that person is better suited for you and yeah. then you would someone else would send people your way because you might be better suited for for them yeah no to totally agree with you on that that you know just being honest and straightforward and being like this is not actually a fit and actually mm -hmm. taking some time for yourself to consider what is the right client fit for you so that you know when somebody comes who's not a fit that you can you know you can gracefully push push them in the other direction or say here's a better choice um it's not going to work out for us and you know the, the money that you save doing that is enormous absolutely enormous um it, in terms of your you know the the business structure that you've got um what kind of scale are you at at the moment it is just me, um, and it is just me by design. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I wanted to leave the, the standard office. Uh, I really wanted autonomy, um, and I wanted to be in charge of everything, I guess. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure exactly what I'm signing up for, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes there are too many hats, um, but I enjoy the fact that I don't need to discuss anything with anyone. Like, I just go with my own feeling on things and kind of try to solve problems as I go along. Um, there are some difficulties with that sometimes. Sometimes you do need someone to uh, to run ideas past. Um, mm -hmm. But most of the time it seems to work quite well and I would like to stay quite small actually. What was it that had you, is this something that you'd always wanted to do as, a, as an architect, you'd always had in your, in your mind, I wanna set up my own practice? No, not at all. If you asked me the same question even two, three years ago, I would have said, no, absolutely. I'm happy working for someone else. I don't have the stress. I do what I need to do. Um, I really liked my job. I was very happy. Um, I think it was COVID. COVID was the thing uh -huh. that showed all of us that there's another way um, of life. Um, mm -hmm. And to start with, I was living in central London. And then when I moved back to Surrey uh, during COVID, um, then when the offices reopened, all of a sudden I was faced with a three hour daily commute. That's if everything went to plan and the trains were running um, and very quickly realized that it's just not the way I want to live. And I really yeah. like where I really enjoy where I live and I don't want to move. Uh, if anything, I'm moving more to the countryside. <laughs> um, yeah. So I thought there has to be a way to do this and to be able to live where you want to live. Mm -hmm. Interesting, and and then so you you made you started to make the moves of um, setting up your your own business. Did you have a client all ready to go before you left, or was it more of a sort a kind of we're going to jump into it and see what happens? It was exactly that. Um, so I think once the floodgate opened of this like urge for independence and autonomy in life and mm -hmm. professionally, um, I I handed in my notice and then. 
I didn't have anything. There were there were no there weren't even contacts because I never really thought about it seriously. It was not there was very minimal preparation. But what I had was six months of my notice. And then I thought, okay, so now I'm going to save like I've never saved before and <laughs> to give myself that. You, you gave a six month notice. I, I had to, yeah. Oh, was, you had to. Okay, all right. It was, it was quite a long, long time. Um, so then I had six months to kind of start preparing for what was about to happen. And that was January last year. So I've sort of <laughs> celebrated my first birthday. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, and, but, and that, 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 that's that's quite good actually like you know the like a six month a six month notice in this kind of context did they try and um you know negotiate for you to stay on or offer you any anything to kind of uh, yeah I, I think i think it was quite hard uh for the office to to accept my departure mm -hmm. um but it was just one of those things it is it is it is business at the end of the day but yeah um, well, once once the ideas kind of start to take root, then it's difficult to 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 let go of it. Um, you can't close it, no. <laughs> so, how long did it take you to win your first your first project? And you know, were you developing the brand during that six months? So you had a little bit of overlap, and you were kind of setting stuff up. No, I wasn't. And you know what? I, I found that I almost couldn't mentally. It was. Um, I think people fall into two different categories. There mm -hmm. will be those people who will start the, what they call the side hustle, you know, mm -hmm. on, the, on the side whilst they're still working in the office, they will start the, the you know, the, the thing rolling, um, start looking for, for clients, start networking, building the website. And they still have that confidence of a paycheck at the end of the month. Um, I couldn't do that. Uh, I just felt like, well, I'm so comfortable maybe what was but maybe i don't need to do my own thing like this is so good right like mm -hmm. you just do what you know you're, you're you're comfortable in that environment and i knew that i needed to jump off the cliff and mm -hmm. then to go okay i have six months of savings and i have to find clients there is no other way and then i was faced with everything that hits you once you make that step because you go okay so there's a time clock literally ticking and i have to do everything that i don't want to do i've never done before yeah. have to network what is even networking to find clients <laughs> amazing amazing and where did your first client come from okay so my first client actually came immediately it was within the, within days of me starting but that was actually through another architect that i teach mm -hmm. with um so they had a smaller project and they said oh i think it'd be a great match if we if we work together on this project um and it was more of an interior based project mm -hmm. So I jumped on that and that gave me three months sort of freelancing um, employment situation where I was able to to do that a couple of days a week and then teach and also, you know, look for, for clients uh, properly. But the first big client uh, for Studio L, like independently came in, I think it was around June. So actually those six months were like almost on the dot. <laughs> right. Wow. Amazing. It's, it's it's very um, interesting, actually, like when we when we kind of um, look at that, you know, the things that we do to win the first the first projects and the kind of going outside and getting very uncomfortable. And there's a whole world of, you know, I've got to go networking. Or where do I even begin to network? And then, you know, there can be like six months worth of going to a load of really dodgy networking events with bad wine and you know not the kind of people that you want to be hanging out with and then eventually you, you stumble across the right thing and you've got to think about well what niche do I want to be in and often we have this bit of a, a dis like a, 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 a difference between our own minds of what we think is a good niche certainly when we're set, setting up a, a practice versus what is actually real niches that are tangible on the on the outside um, when you again, when you first started and you were kind of looking for clients and kind of and then this is all part and parcel of the developing the brand, what was your starting point? Were you kind of consciously thinking, you know, well, there's the there's a demographic here in in Surrey and that kind of green belt um that I could approach, or was it something more left field? Uh no, it was definitely that. And mm -hmm. again, that just goes with my experience. I know that market, that, like I know the high-end market very well. Mm -hmm. I know what sort of service goes with it. I know how it operates. And it's something I really enjoy. I enjoy mm -hmm. the bespoke design and 
and details which are, you know, and objects which are expensive. And I'm not going to be apologetic about it. And I think I went through a stage when I felt like I had to be like, oh no, I'm going to design for, you know, I want to make design accessible to all and this and that. And then, um, and then you very quickly realize that, you know what, like stick to, <laughs> stick to what you know and what you like, and you don't have to apologize for it. And yeah. sometimes there is a bit of a stigma and teasing amongst other architects to go, mm-hmm. well, I just design marble you know, bathrooms. And you go, yeah, but actually like I, I enjoy it and my clients are very happy. <laughs> good. All good. Good. No, I, that's actually very, that's very interesting that the, you know, what you just pointed upon there, actually, the the guilt that a lot of architects feel about who they're designing for or their clientele. Um, and this is a really interesting kind of industry conversation to look at a little bit, because I see it all the time and I see um, many architects um, perhaps not having a very mature attitude to the mechanics of capitalism and the mechanics of like you're now running a business Mm -hmm. and whilst it's very virtuous to um to make design accessible for all and I'm not saying that that's not something that we should be interested in there's a responsibility when you're when we're talking about those things that they need to be supported financially and so what happens unintentionally is that we get a lot of architectural businesses that end up negating the business side or even seeing you know charging high fees or working with a certain type of demographic as being problematic and it might be problematic due to a set of ideologies or belief systems that they've got and then usually what happens is those businesses really really struggle um and it become it can become quite difficult so it's very reassuring to actually hear that actually you know you were being quite authentic with your own set of values and what you enjoy doing and you and you knew that that was a marketplace that you were quite comfortable in and it was where you're able to do your best work mm, yeah and i think there's a certain sort of cynicism that comes with uh with this notion that you have to you know have rock bottom fees and 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 do good and save the world and again mm-hmm. i resonate with what you said i i think these are amazing ethos to to try and work towards but you know then you have the reality where you need to make a living um and also there there are still clients there's still people it's still design you still Mm -hmm. get amazing projects um and you have a high budget to play with as well so I, i i don't know i don't i don't see what the what this crime is of working yeah. in no, I, I'm, no I'm, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you and I used to work at, um, at Richard Rogers practice RSHP and he had a very strong philosophy of you know being able to design for everybody and he was often he often very publicly w- was making uh, a declaration for you know civic architecture and architecture for people and as a practice they wanted to do a lot of kind of social housing and more affordable housing type of work and actually had a very good research department there where they were pioneering kind of modular building and this is like 15 years ago and you know that and and, you know Oxley Woods got built and a lot of that kind of stuff was supported by the fact that they were very commercially thoughtful and well-run business and he didn't make a distinction between, um, you know, we're also going to serve the the top strata of society because by able for us being able to do that, we can keep the business going and we can keep people employed and we can keep the thinking going around architecture. And as architects, we are here to serve everybody. And there's a, a kind of commercial reality of of when you when you make a concerted business effort to work with and identify and again when I work with with clients and we're looking at um, you know finding a niche market one of the criteria to assess if this market is going to be good is is it going to be profitable Mm -hmm. and I I, you know I've I've seen businesses who have gone into a a world of doing focusing on commercial on community work for example and then they're not paying themselves and they haven't got people on the you know they can't afford to pay their team properly and there's a there's a there's a there's a lack of integrity with that for me it that just commercially it doesn't it doesn't make sense and you know it's I, I think it's very important for us to 
as an industry mature and grow up and have um you know much more robust conversations about capitalism where money comes from where our place is is in it and actually that doing business is it's a very important skill set to to be developing if you're going to run your own company for sure yeah i agree um so what's next <laughs> what is next um attracting more of the clients that i that i want to work with um so i have no big ambition of expanding in terms of you know hiring people or bringing mm -hmm. on 20 different projects i think it's just uh getting a higher caliber of the clients and the properties that i want to work with so it seems like i have fallen into a, a bit of a niche which i didn't predict when i started out of mm -hmm. uh, working within the green belt and aonbs uh, and incredibly beautiful sites um but also very difficult sites. So now I exclusively work with a planning consultant and we kind of join forces and we go in on those really difficult applications, which is definitely not what I envisioned when I started, but it's something that works incredibly well when you let different experts do different roles and you don't try to pretend that you know you know the ins and outs of the planning law and you let someone else handle it. Mm -hmm. And that just opens up your creativity to actually focus on the design. So. Um, I think I would love to explore this niche further and kind of, you know, stay stay in the home counties area and, and work on really nice sites. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, very inspiring uh, to speak with you and to see what you've done in, in such a short period of uh, time. And, uh, you know, it's got you've got a good sort of business head and uh, identified a very a good demographic and wonderful to speak to you. So thank you very much for coming on the show and sharing your expertise. Thank you so much for having me. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. Hey, a quick note. This is Enoch here and I have a question for you. Do you know someone who's highly professional, loves speaking with people, and is skilled in the area of professional selling? Well, if so, I'm looking for a director of enrollment to join our team here at Business of Architecture. This is a sales position. And if you or someone you know wants to impact an industry and earn an excellent income doing so, head on over to businessofarchitecture.com for more information. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.